July 1st, 2008. In northern Japan's Iwate Prefecture, a comfortable temperature spreads across the land as summer slowly made its way to the northern hemisphere. A group of road workers drive along narrow prefectural road 171 in the mountainous and wooded area near Kawai village around 4.30 p.m. Their car stops along the Shimohanaizawa bridge, one of the small passings one would have to cross to continue along the way. One of the workers gets out of the car to wash his hands in the stream along the bridge when he suddenly stops in his tracks. Because of its white color, I initially believed it to be a doll, is what the 32-year-old man mentioned in an interview with the Asai Shimbun two days later. Though before him was not a doll, but the half-dressed body of 17-year-old Kozue Sato floating face down within the stream. Investigators are immediately called and rush over to the scene without hesitation. While the investigation just started to get ground and the body was still not officially identified, a few hours later, an acquaintance of the victim crashes his car two hours away from the scene where the body was found. The acquaintance is 28-year-old Katsuyuki Obata, the boyfriend of a friend of the victim. The following morning, investigators receive calls from the family, friends, and even Obata himself that he is at Unosu Cliff with the intention to jump to his death. That when Obata's father shows up, the 28-year-old is gone, and even after multiple officers search on foot and by boat, only a few items remain on the cliff's edge as proof of Obata's prior presence. While investigators seem to quickly link Obata's strange behavior to Kozue Sato's death and soon place him on Japan's national wanted list, others seem to believe there is more to this story. Let's explore the facts of the investigation, the events leading up to Kozue Sato's death and the fight of an investigative journalist for the truth against media and police only to end up losing his life in the process. This is the true story of Kozue Sato's murder. Miyako police arrived at the scene where the female victim's body was found by road workers on the 1st of July near Iwate Prefecture's Kawai village, which merged with Miyako City in 2010. The body was located in a wooded area along Prefectural Road 171, about two and a half kilometers away from the nearest house. Approached from the southern part, a few small bridges proceed before reaching the stream along the Shimohanaizawa bridge where the body had been discovered. According to locals, there are not many cars passing the bridge in general, but during summers, more vehicles would pass as the road leads to the Yusendo Cave and would be used by those visiting the nearby streams and forests. The body was found face down in a 10 to 20 centimeter deep stream, only wearing underwear and a black short-sleeved hoodie. At closer inspection, false eyelashes, colored contact lenses, and silver earrings were found. Noticeable were the spider tattoo on the victim's right upper arm and a butterfly and flower tattoo on the right side of her back. The victim wasn't wearing any shoes, and no items such as identity cards or a cell phone were found. Different bridge heights are reported to be between 3 and 5 meters. The distance between the bridge and the body is said to be 5 meters. While this could be important, since the culprit might have thrown or dragged the body further from the bridge, the body could have simply been thrown off, after which it could have floated away from the bridge. The culprit had either thrown the 160 centimeter tall and over 52 kilogram weighing body over the bridge's railing or pushed her underneath as a second option. While some say the body was placed deliberately in a place where it could be easily discovered, others believe the culprit to have panicked and to quickly get rid of the body. The bridge is located in the center of a 160 meter straight road at which the culprit could easily be seen and it's said that further down Route 171, there are better hiding spots available. According to local newspaper Iwate Nippo, a day after the victim's body was found, 30 officers investigated the scene in more detail. It appeared no signs of struggle were found near the body or on the bridge, making it possible she was killed elsewhere before being disposed of. In addition, no footprints, tire marks, or items were discovered near the scene. The at this point still unidentified body was brought to the Department of Forensic Medicine at Iwate Medical University, 
and a judicial autopsy was performed the very next day on the 2nd of July. The official report published the following results. As cause of death, homicide was stated. The time of death was estimated to be between the 30th of June and the 1st of July. The circumstances state there to be neck compressions, a band-shaped epidermal detachment, and a purple-red discoloration of the skin. It's also mentioned that the victim sustained a splitting head wound, exposing the skull. As noteworthy other points, two tattoos are described to be found, one on the right upper arm and one on the right side of the victim's back. Not specifically mentioned in the autopsy conclusion itself, but mentioned in newspaper Ivate Nipo was that the victim's lip was injured as well and that her teeth were broken. Nearly around the same time the victim's body was found, parents from Kudihara City in Miyagi Prefecture had reported their daughter to be missing since the 28th of June. When police connected the missing person report and the victim's characteristics of the body found at the scene, the parents were called in. On the 3rd of July, the body of 17-year-old Kozue Sato is officially identified by her parents. Kozue Sato lived together with her parents in Kurihara City, about a two-hour drive south from the location her body was found. While she had been in high school before, she had dropped out not long before her death. Not much else is published about Kozue herself, and her old online profile only gives a small glimpse in who she actually was, writing things like, I want to build a happy family, have a wonderful husband, and cute baby. On her profile, the following photo of her tattoos was allegedly posted as well. While Kozue's posts are allegedly removed by now, one source reports that Kozue's life had been tough, with her starting and ending three different relationships between the end of 2007 and April of 2008. It was also rumored that Kozue posted on her profile she became pregnant by April of 2008 and that she was going to get an abortion, the only indirect reports of this information can be found without remaining evidence of her posts. The same sources shared that her mental health had been unstable in the months prior to her death, even to the point of her wanting to harm herself. Not much else is made public about Kozue or her family. Around 9pm on the day Kozue's body was discovered, a car crashed about 100 kilometers northeast of the location of the crime scene. The driver was 28-year-old Katsuyuki Obada, a high school dropout who was unemployed at the time and lived out of his car while often staying with friends and family. The Tanohata village native grew up with his two younger brothers, father Kazushi Obada and mother. Obada was described as quiet and introverted as a younger child, but had changed in high school. According to a colleague at a seafood processing plant he worked at for four months in 2005, he didn't seem out of the ordinary, other than that he took a little more time off than others. The morning after the crash, Obada went to nearby Unosu Cliff and threatened to jump to his family and friends, while even contacting police as well. When his father rushed over to the cliff though, Obada had disappeared, never to be seen alive again. Not only seemed the timing of the crash and Obada's strange behavior suspiciously close to the time Kozue's body was found, Obada had also been known by police around his hometown, as he had reported himself as the victim of an extortion incident not long before. In the days prior to the discovery of Kozue's body, Obada had called Officer Chiba from the Kuji police several times about this extortion incident. Another noteworthy connection to mention is that Katsuyuki Obada was the boyfriend of a good high school friend of the victim, who coincidentally had exactly the same first and last name as the victim, being Kozue Sato. As is used in multiple sources, from here on out, the murder victim will be referred to as Kozue B, while Obada's girlfriend will be called Kozue A. To get a full grasp on the events surrounding Kozue B's death, let's take a more detailed look at the rather complex timeline that preceded the teenager's murder. Mid-February 2007, Kozue A meets Katsuyuki Obara. Kozue A and Kozue B spend time at a photo booth in a game center in Tomei City when Katsuyuki Obara and a friend approach the two teenagers. Mm -hmm. 
こで遊んでて声かけられてみたいな、うん、それはその小瀬ちゃんと一緒にはい In an interview, Obara's friend said, Me and Obara met two girls who were both called Kozue Sato around mid February in 2007. We met them in a shopping mall in Miyagi Prefecture. It all started as a so called pickup, and while Kozue B and I separated soon after, Kozue A and Obara continued to date. Not long after Kozue A starts dating Obara, she decides to live with him. Both girls eventually drop out of high school, while their friendship slowly fades. Contact between Kozue A and Kozue B was limited after this, and it's described that while Kozue B and Obara met each other a few times, they were not close. May 1st, 2007. Short on money, Obara decides to visit one of his seniors living in Fudai Village, a man in his 30s by sources referred to as Mr. Z. While nearly a year earlier, in October of 2006, Obara had been introduced to a carpenter job in Saitama Prefecture by the same senior. Obara had ran away after only a few days on the job. Mr. Z had been angry after the incident, but mentioned on the phone he wasn't angry anymore. Together with his younger brother and Kozue A, Obara drove up to Mr. Z's house. While Kozue A waited in the car, Obara and his brother entered the house. According to Obara and his younger brother, Mr. Z was angry and threatened Obara by putting a Japanese style sword in his mouth. He then put a knife close to Obara's left pinky and dropped a crystal ashtray on the back of the knife, which caused an injury to Obara's finger. あのまあ、詰めることまではしなかったですけど、まあ、考えられない光景だったんで。Mr. Z then demanded Obara to write a loan of 1.2 million yen and pressed him to write down a guarantor. Obara first asked his brother, who refused to be part of all this. He then decided to write down Kozue A's full name, being Kozue Sato, and added her phone number as well. Kozue A remembers that when Obara and his brother returned, his hand was bleeding from the incident. In later interviews, though, Mr. Z explained his side of the story, saying that if he actually blackmailed Obara, police would have already arrested him, also mentioning that he doesn't own a Japanese sword. Mr. Z did mention that since Obara didn't seem to take the prior incident of him running away from the job serious, even though Mr. Z had to travel to the job site where Obara had run away from to personally apologize, costing him money in the process. Mr. Z said that he asked Obara to pay 100,000 yen instead of 1.2 million yen to cover the cost of the incident. Because Obara didn't seem to be serious and kept laughing, Mr. Z mentioned he slapped Obara a few times, but never used a sword or knife. In May 2008, about a year after the extortion incident, Obara stumbles upon an online post on a now closed bulletin board called Nationwide Wanted. The post requested for information about Obara's whereabouts and included his name and a photo of his face. The post was made by a user under the ID, the Yakuza, which Obara thought to be Mr. Z. While looking for Obara, Mr. Z had allegedly said things like, If I find him, I'll definitely kill him. I'll set his house on fire. It's also reported that Kozue A had been contacted through the phone number that was given to Mr. Z. In later interviews, Mr. Z admitted he placed Obara's name and photo on the website, saying that Obara's behavior was outrageous, as he had been running away without paying. Strangely enough, the whole website shut down on July 15th, only two weeks after Kozue B's body was found. June 3rd, 2008, Obara and his girlfriend Kozue A visit the Kuji police station and file a police report for the extortion incident with Mr. Z due to his increasing anxiety over Mr. Z searching for him. The policeman involved with the case is reported to be Officer Chiba. Both Obara and Kozue A were reportedly questioned at the time. June 22, 2008. Obara's younger brother, who was present during the extortion incident, is asked to come to the Kuji police station to talk about the extortion incident. Police at the time reportedly mentioned, 
Your brother is in trouble, so please tell us what happened at the time. If you don't come to the police station, you may be arrested. Obara's younger brother talked to officers for over three hours about the incident, even drawing a floor map of Mr. Z's house. The brother mentioned that at the time, police seemed to listen and compare statements. その方と出会った経路や、あと、教活の状況などなど話して、で、ま、兄の教授長っていうんですかね。そういうのも照らし合わせながら見てだったんで、ま、結構操作は進んでだったのかなってその時は思って。June 28th, 2008, 10 a.m. While Obara was asleep, Kozue A visited a nearby convenience store. Obara had reportedly worsened his behavior towards his girlfriend, as was later said in interviews with Kozue A. I've always wanted to break up with him. Even though he didn't work, he got violent and yelled at me. At that point, Kozue A decided to get away from Obara. With only half a tank of gas left and only about 1,000 yen in his pocket, Kozue A believed Obara would not have the means to chase her. From the convenience store, she headed to Morioka Station, then took a train bound for her parents' hometown of Tome City in Miyagi Prefecture. From 2 p.m. onwards, while Kozue A was on her way to Tome City, she receives calls and messages from Obara, saying things like, I want you back. I know you could escape today. Let's go to the Kuji Police Department together to get the complaint dismissed. It won't be dismissed unless we go together. According to Kozue A, this was the first time Obara had mentioned he wanted to withdraw the extortion report, though at the time she believed he said it to get her back. In hindsight, Kozue A mentions that she realized he was serious about withdrawing the complaint though. After a while, Kozue A finally agreed to Obara's request to let him know when she would arrive home at her parents. Before she arrived home, she spent time at Ichinoseki, waiting for her father to pick her up after work. Shortly after 9 p.m., Kozue A and her father returned home in Tomei City. She immediately let Obara know that she returned home at the time. Between 9.30 and 10 p.m., Kozue B received a call from Obara, who said, I would like to consult you about some love problems. Can we meet now? While Kozue B and Obara knew each other, they didn't seem to have been in frequent contact, and the friendship between Kozue A and Kozue B seemed to have become estranged after Obara had started dating Kozue A. With this in mind, the sudden request to meet Kozue B seemed surprising. At the time of the call, Kozue B had been with a male acquaintance, who said the following after the call ended. It's Obara, right? Kozue B replied yes with a disgusted tone. Around 10 minutes after 10 p.m., Kozue A received a call from an unknown number. Even though the caller had actually been Kozue B, Obara had allegedly deleted all of Kozue A's phone numbers and addresses to prevent her from getting help. Since Kozue A didn't know who the caller was, she ignored the call. Around 10.20 p.m., Kozue B is about to leave her acquaintance and jokingly says, I might be killed. If that happens, I'll call you. She then leaves and heads to the 7-Eleven where she would meet Obara. The store is located in the center of Tome City and takes close to two hours to reach from the Morioka racecourse where Obada had been in the morning. Around 10.30 p.m., Kozue B tries to call Kozue A again, though this time she tries to call the family's landline. Kozue A's father picks up, and while puzzled his daughter, who just arrived home after being away for a year, is called through the family phone, he hands over the phone to his daughter. で、携帯に電話あれ
同一にか電話が来るというのはすごいタイミングの良さっていうのは今,今思えば不思議なことです。The next ten minutes, both teenagers talk about nothing specific but exchange their mail addresses and exchange the following messages throughout the evening after the call ended. What's up with Obata? We broke up today. What are you planning to do now? I don't know, but I don't want this anymore. Kozue A later mentioned in an interview that she believed Obata was next to Kozue B during the exchange because the messages kept asking questions as if she was Obata. Despite Obata's perseverance, he did not visit Kozue A's parents' home that night. From 10 43 to 11 pm, Kozue B was captured on the security camera at the convenience store reading a magazine by herself. According to her father, there was no sign of Obata seen on the footage. June 29, 2008, 30 minutes after midnight, Kozue A received the last message from Kozue B after exchanging about six messages. This seems to be the last message sent from Kozue B's phone as after this, she went missing. From 2 14 to 2 17 am, Obata was captured on security camera footage, refueling his car at a self service gas station. While the footage is not made public, It said Obata's right hand was wrapped in a piece of cloth. Obata's father, Kazushi Obata, said the following in an interview about the footage. During the police interrogation after the incident, detectives from the investigative headquarters showed the footage to me. I think it was Obata in the photos. They didn't tell me the location of where the footage was taken. The location of the gas station is not made public by police, though multiple sources speculate it to be in the Morioka city area. At 7 30 am that morning, Obata sent a photo over to Kozue A, which appears to show an injury to his right hand, which hadn't been present at the time she left Obata at the racetrack parking area. The photo was accompanied by a message saying, I'm going to withdraw the damage report, so if you don't come to Morioka again, I'll be in trouble. Kozue A believed this to be a lie, as Officer Chiba, who was leading the case, told her she wasn't needed for the investigation into the extortion case anymore. Kozue A had also allegedly tried to run away from Obata multiple times in the past, but had not been successful up until this point. This made her ignore Obata's advances to get her back. At 9 30 am, Obata arrived at the Tanohata village home of his younger brother, who was the second son of the Obata family. According to his brother, Obata seemed his normal self, other than an injury to his right hand. <laughs> At the time, Obara seemed down and said, I don't have a job and I can't do this anymore. Between 9 30 and noon, on Obara's request, Obara's brother and his wife sorted out the belongings of Kozue A. Which were still in Obata's car. The luggage found in the car included clothing, stuffed animals, a wallet, watch, sneakers, cosmetics, and Obata's juji ball. While clearing the items, the couple had found bloodstains on the driver's side's right side, which had likely been the result of Obata's hand injury. No blood or other stains had been noticed in the trunk or passenger seats. At 7 20 p.m., Obata, his brother, and his wife visit Sai Seikai Iwaizumi Hospital in nearby Iwaizumi town to get his hand injury checked. At the hospital, Obata told the doctor, I got drunk and hit a wall. According to the doctor who examined him, the grip strength in Obata's right hand was close to zero, to the point where his hand could not open or close properly. <laughs> Obata was advised to visit the hospital in Miyako City for a surgical consult and returned with his brother where he stayed the night. June 30th, 2008, 7 am. Obata wakes up at his brother's house and calls the home of a man reported to be Obata's former high school teacher and mentor. In multiple sources, referred to as Mr. Y or Mr. Yamada as his alias. The two agreed to meet that day. 
At 9 a.m., Obata's brother and his wife go out. At this time, Obata sends Kozue A that he is staying at his brother's house and that he went to the hospital the day before. At 11.30 a.m., Obata stops at the gas station, then drives over to his former teacher's house. At noon, Obata arrives at Mr. Yamada's house. When Mr. Yamada noticed the hand injury, he asked Obata about it, who allegedly replied the following. Something bad happened at my brother's place last night, and I banged on the wall of my brother's house. The statement couldn't be true, as Obata had arrived at his brother's house while already having sustained the injury. During his stay at Mr. Yamada's house, Obata exchanged messages on his phone and called with detectives from the Kuji Police Department. According to a message Obata sent to an acquaintance at 12.19 p.m. that day, he mentioned, I called the Kuji police and tried to dismiss the case against Mr. Z, but it didn't work. They told me that the prefectural police was handling the incident. It seems they'll call me tomorrow or the day after. When asked about the call to the police, Obata told Mr. Yamada, I have a problem with a scary person from Fudai, and I have filed a report against him for extortion. At 5.30 p.m., Obata left Mr. Yamada's house and returned to his brother's house, arriving at around 6.50 p.m. At 8 p.m., Obata's father, Kazushi Obata, visits the home of Obata's brother. During the visit, Obata told his father, I want to withdraw the complaint. The reason is that the threats by Mr. Z have weakened. Between 8.30 and 9.30 p.m., Obata's father calls police officer Chiba, asking him to dismiss the extortion report. As a reply, Officer Chiba said the following. After this answer, Obata decides to give up on withdrawing the extortion report, leaving the investigation ongoing. That night, Obata stayed at his brother's house once again. July 1st, 2008. 9 a.m., Obata once again visits Mr. Yamada's home. According to his former teacher, Obata appeared in the same clothes as the day before and didn't seem to be particularly different. He was just watching TV, eating lunch, and made a call with Officer Chiba from the Kuji Police Department. While Obata's phone had allegedly been ringing a lot, Mr. Yamada said it wasn't clear who was calling him. At 4.30 p.m., the body of Kozue B is discovered in the mountains near Kawai village. At this point, information had been officially publicized about Kozue B's death. At 5 p.m., Obata left Mr. Yamada's house. While some sources report Obata went shopping, it seems he went out without telling Mr. Yamada where he was going. Around the same time, Kozue B's father reported his daughter missing at the Miyagi Prefectural Police Wakayanagi Station as he hadn't seen her for three days since the 28th of June. At 7.25 p.m., Obata sends his younger brother the following message, of which the context is not completely clear. Yes, it's bad. I wonder if I can start my life over again. Between 7.30 and 8 p.m., Obata returns to Mr. Yamada's house. According to Mr. Yamada, at this time, Obata's mood seemed to have changed completely as he was very upset. While sitting in his car, he was overheard crying and shouting, I can't stay in Tanohata anymore. No matter how hard I try, no one will recognize me. When a car passed the house, Obata mentioned he assumed the police were coming while looking scared. 8.30 p.m. Obata gave Mr. Yamada a photo and a charm then left his house. At 9 p.m., Obata crashed his beloved Toyota Celsius into a utility pole on the opposite lane of the Rikuju Kaigan seaside line. Interestingly enough, Obata told his brother that he was going back to Miyagi that day, though the car seemed to have moved in the opposite direction from Miyagi as the car was facing towards the north at the crash site. Shortly after the crash, a man from Tanohata, who had been fishing in Fudai village, happened to pass the accident. The man, who is referred to by multiple sources as Mr. T or the alias Takafumi Tadokoro, stopped to help Obata out. According to his testimony, Obata got out of the car, saying he was okay, but seemed unsteady on his feet. 
車はまあここからもう真正面でぶつかってたすよこの方向からぶつかってたと、ええ、もう俺はおしまいだとか、ええ、死ぬしかないとか言ってましたよ The following conversation took place according to Mr. Tadokoro Your hand is swollen It isn't a car accident Then what happened? I got into a fight with a woman and raised my hand After Mr. Tadokoro dropped Obara off near his residence, Obara mentioned he may have forgotten his wallet in his car. Mr. Tadokoro then went back to the scene of the accident and felt around the car with his hands to look for the wallet, not knowing the car could potentially be part of a crime scene. Obara spent the rest of the evening at his parents' home, planning to wait to sober up before handing himself over to the police. Obara's father and his second son took care of the incident in the meantime and returned home a few hours later. July 2nd, 2008. 5 a.m. Someone with a male voice, alleged to be part of the Iwate Prefectural Police Miyako Station, called Kozue A's home. When Kozue A's father answered the phone, the person asked if Kozue was still alive. Kozue A's father said, Of course she is alive, she is sleeping right now. The caller answered, saying, Oh, I see, then hung up the phone. It's not certain whether or not the phone call indicated that Miyako police knew of the Kuji police investigation of the extortion incident where Kozue A was a guarantor. If at this time the two incidents were already linked and Kozue A's name was found as the guarantor of the extortion incident, police seem to have not been aware that there were two Kozue Satos involved. This may have caused police to call the house of Kozue A instead of calling the house of the actual victim, Kozue B. One journalist blog post even mentioned that a police officer from the Iwata Prefectural Police had told him, We failed to recognize there were two Kozue Satos. At 7 a.m., Obara's father urges his son to go to the police within an hour to report last night's accident. Obara replies that he made an appointment with Inspector Chiba of the Kuji Police Department, asking his father to drive him to the station. 40 minutes later, though, Obara suddenly disappeared without having breakfast after using his cell phone since 7 a.m. His father speculated him to have gone to the Kuji train station but couldn't find Obara anywhere after running over to the station in Tanohata village. In reality, Obara tried to get a taxi, but no cars were available at the time. However, he happened to come across a relative, who by some is referred to as Tadashi Yamamoto as an alias. Obara asked the relative, My car broke down, so could you please give me a ride to the Shi Bridge? which is a location where others have allegedly jumped to their death before. During the drive over, Obara changed his destination twice and finally ended up getting out of the car at a straight road leading up to Inosu Cliff about two kilometers ahead, telling his relative he was about to meet an acquaintance. <laughs> When Obara got out of the car, he stayed on the side of the road and immediately started calling someone. It's not known who the person on the other end of the line was, and there is no public evidence police took action to obtain this information. The relative noticed that when he dropped Obara off, he was wearing a grey shirt, jeans and flip-flops, without carrying a bag or having signs of bulging pockets. At 8.30 a.m., Obara called Mr. Yamada, his former teacher who we visited the days prior. Around that same time, Obara sent Kozue A a photo of the edge of the cliff saying, I'm going to die. As a reaction, Kosue A tried calling Obara, who only answered his battery is running out and hung up. Kosue A then tried calling Officer Chiba, who did not respond even after two to three calls. 
Between 9 and 9.10 a.m., Obara's father had a phone conversation with Kuchi Police Inspector Chiba, who mentioned, I just received a call from the person in question and immediately hung up afterwards. At the same time, former teacher Mr. Yamada rushed over to Inosu Cliff after the unsettling call he received from Obara. When he arrived, Obara was crouched down on the edge of the cliff, having climbed over the fence. Obara was heard talking on the phone and was heard laughing, while sounding as if he was talking to police, as Mr. Yamada had heard before when Obara was at his house. When Mr. Yamada called over to Obara, he initially didn't reply. Mr. Yamada then put a can of coffee down on the ground and said, I'll put it here so you can drink it. Then Obara replied, Police is coming now. My youngest brother is coming too, so don't tell anyone. Mr. Yamada was at ease that Obara was talking to police and felt it wasn't as serious as he first thought, leaving Unosu Cliff as the last person to have seen Obara alive. Mr. Yamada did mention that while Obara called the police, there were no signs of police rushing to the cliff. At 9.27 a.m., Obara sent a message to one of his brothers containing the following. Goodbye, I'm sorry for all the trouble. An hour later at 10.30 a.m., Obara made a last phone call to his father, saying, Dad, I'm sorry for causing you all sorts of trouble. I'll be gone, so I'll leave the rest to you. Ten minutes later, Obara made a final call to his youngest brother to tell him he was going to jump if his brother would show up. His youngest brother then called their father, after which they looked for Obara at Unosu Cliff at around 11 a.m. At this time, Obara was nowhere to be found. Around noon, the youngest brother called Kuji Officer Chiba to report Obara's car accident from the day before. Officer Chiba allegedly explained on a call that he had been called by Obara that morning, saying that he was at Unosu Cliff with his former teacher nearby. Obara had supposedly expressed his concerns to him about being a suspect for Kozue's disappearance. Around 5 p.m., Kozue A told Kuji Officer Chiba over the phone that Obara was at Unosu Cliff and that he was talking as if he was going to die. She requested him to please go see him. Inspector Chiba allegedly replied with, Ah, I understand. Well then. Then hung up and had no further phone contact with Kozue A. At the same time, Miyagi Prefectural Police Wakayanagi Station reached out to Kozue B's family, saying a body similar to that of Kozue B had been found. Also around this hour, police received a search request from Obara's father to look for his son. According to some, this was the moment that Obara actually started to get identified as the suspect in the murder case. July 3rd, 2008. In the morning, the body found was confirmed to be that of Kozue B by her parents. Possibly around 4 p.m., a government employee cleaning Unosu Cliff found items believed to belong to Obara near the tip of the cliff. The belongings were scattered around the cliff's edge outside the boundaries of the fenced off area. Items included a wallet placed on a yellow handkerchief, car keys, a driver's license, two empty coffee cans, seven cigarettes, a watch with Kozue A's name on the back, a phone battery without the actual phone, a payment card, and sandals. Since it's reported that the sun was almost setting when items found were reported to police, investigators allegedly postponed the search for Obara to the next morning. In the evening, Obara's car was confiscated by police after it was found at another location in Tanohata village. Investigators had found a hair belonging to Kozue B, women's footwear, and some other items inside the car. While blood was discovered in the front of the car and on the airbag, no blood was discovered in the trunk. According to local newspaper Iwate Nippo, detectives had rushed to perform DNA tests on the blood as well, though no information has been made public whether or not the DNA belonged to Obara or Kozue B. Police tried connecting the footwear to Kozue B's murder, as her body had been found barefoot. July 4, 2008, at 8.30 a.m., 15 investigators, together with members of the local fire department, sent out prefectural patrol boats and several fishing boats to search for Obara, trying to locate his body in a 100-meter radius around the cliff's edge where his belongings were found. At the time, Obara's father asked police, can you send out police dogs? With police replying, Father, police dogs cost money every few minutes. It's expensive. Will you pay for it? Resulting in police not actually using dogs to track the traces of his son. 
At the end of the morning, the Ivate Nipo reported that nobody was found. While initial reports state there was a possibility he had jumped, investigators proposed that he may have faked that he had jumped to his death and actually escaped the scene. From the 4th of July until the end of the month, police checked on Obara's brother's house almost every day to see if he had contact with his brother. Unbeknownst to Obara's parents, investigators also checked the bank accounts of both parents to see if any of the money was used to escape. July 29th, 2008 Nearly a month after Kozue B's body was found, an arrest warrant is issued for Katsuyuki Obara on suspicion of her murder. Based on findings of Kozue B's hair and women's shoes in Obara's car, Iwate Prefectural Police Miyako Station believed Obara to be the culprit, placing him on the national wanted list and opening a public investigation into his whereabouts. According to police, Obara probably lured out Kozue B out in the night of June 28th strangled her to death in his car on the way back to Tanohata village and drove for nearly two hours to abandon the body near Kabai village. Police then believed him to have returned to Tanohata village, arriving at his brother's place in the morning. They then speculate he eventually went to Inosu cliff and faked his own death. As a reaction to police switching to a public investigation, Kozue B's father, Masahiro Sato, gave the following response. I was worried the incident would be forgotten. Through a public investigation, I hope that with cooperation of police and everyone providing information, an arrest will be made as soon as possible. And like that, the case seemed as good as solved, and a manhunt for Katsuyuki Obara was the only thing left for investigators to complete. Until... <laughs> え、岩手県の河井村で遺体となった検査された佐藤小勢さん。え、河井村市内における女性殺人事件。え、この事件について取材を続けてきました。秋岡 who was 50 years old at the time of the incident, was a former police officer who turned into an investigative journalist after retiring from the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department in 1999 at the age of 41. Kuroki started his career as an officer in 1976, influenced by his father who had worked at the police station as well. During his 23 years as a police officer, Kuroki won the Metropolitan Police Department Inspector General's Award 23 times due to his efforts in cracking down on firearms and organized crime. While Kuroki's heart for the police force never faded, his frustration with certain investigations grew. And after an incident at work that would change his career for the worse, he decided to take the leap of becoming an investigative journalist to use his unique insights as a police officer focusing on multiple cases where people had been wronged by misconducted police investigations. During his time as a journalist, Akio Kuroki investigated and wrote books about cases such as the Tochigi Lynch murder case and the Akita serial child murder case, often criticizing police for negligence of investigations, cover-ups, and self-protection in his works. Kuroki wrote on his blog that he wasn't initially interested in the investigation into Kozue B's death, as from news reports it seemed clear who the culprit was. However, on September 1st, 2008, TBS aired a TV program surrounding the Iwate murder case, which sparked Kuroki's interest in the case. Kuroki drove 700 kilometers to Tanohata village himself and conducted interviews and inspected relevant locations for four days. From this, he soon noticed multiple discrepancies, quickly growing suspicious against police and their investigation, and spent countless hours investigating the case on his own time and funds. While police stated Katsuyuki Obara to have killed Kozue B and faked his own death, Kuroki increasingly believed in Obara's innocence the deeper he dug. From partially censored police documents he received, to discrepancies and in interviews he performed with those involved, Kuroki's frustration with the police investigation grew. Also writing on his blog at the time, the Iwate Prefectural Police's efforts to promote a diligent investigation are nothing more than a performance that leave behind the impression that they carried out the best possible investigation. 
How did Obata strangle his victim with one of his hands injured? Why did police seemingly ignore the complaint filed by Obata? Why was the body dumped far off route? And what was the motive of the murder if Obata was the culprit? Were questions Kudoki had no clear answers for. In order to focus on the Iwate murder incident, Kudoki set up his one-man investigation headquarters while traveling hours between his home in Chiba Prefecture to Iwate Prefecture multiple times a month. He slept in his car for days and reported his findings in great detail on his blog. Even though Kudoki was told, anyone who goes this far is an idiot, his belief there was something more going on was strong. Eventually writing, Iwate Prefectural Police are the ones involved in the incident, I absolutely disagree with the results of the police investigation. His frustrations grew even more when police proposed a special investigative reward of up to 1 million yen to anyone providing information that would lead to Obara's arrest. The reward was requested on the 7th of October 2008 and was accepted and implemented on the 1st of November that same year. About half a year after the public bounty was implemented, on the 13th of May 2009, an unprecedented press conference at Iwate Educational Hall was organized by Kudoki, in which the family of the victim and the family of the supposed suspect collaborated in order to provide information about the murder incident and Obara's subsequent disappearance. <laughs> During the press conference, it was revealed that there had been two Kozue Satos, with Kozue A giving her statement to the press as well. Both families, together with Kozue A and others who held information about the incident, joined forces by submitting a 70-page informative document to multiple organizations, including the Iwate Prefectural Police, the Iwate Prefectural Public Safety Commission, the National Police Agency, and the National Public Safety Commission. The document included interviews with those involved with the murder case, as well as the extortion case in Fudai Village. Their information highlighted discrepancies within the police's investigation, as both families appealed for a proper investigation to be conducted to get the truth revealed. When Kuroki inquired why police didn't investigate the incident in more detail, police replied, We are investigating, but we cannot provide any details. According to Kuroki's blog, media reported things such as a person related to the suspect provided information, which according to him seemed to be an attempt to discredit the report. He also stated that while reporters were present, the conference was either reported inaccurately or not at all in many cases. In some cases, Kuroki even confronted the news outlets, who gave reasons such as it's a company decision or we only report nationwide news which made him wary that media outlets might have been influenced by police. Kudoki's thoughts on the process were included in his blog as well, saying, If you think something is wrong, investigate. If I think something is wrong, I will interview you. That should be the habit of police and media. And yet, specifically in this case, these two important parties have stopped moving as if they were moving in unison. Another strange event surrounding the press conference happened a day later, as it's reported on Kuroki's blog that a mysterious message was sent to Kozue A, supposedly by Miyako police detective Nakayashiki. The messages read, How are you? What have you been up to lately? Has anything changed? A week later, the same person sent another message, saying, I haven't received a reply to my message. Aren't you feeling well? Kozue A seemed to not have replied to the messages, Kudoki described in his blog it was strange the detective sent these messages as the press conference had just taken place.
To understand why Kudoki and family members of both Kozue B and Obara joined forces to request for a better investigation, let's go over some of the main inconsistencies that Kudoki had discussed in his blog post. While his research was extensive and his blog post go into great detail, the main inconsistencies are as follows. Number 1. Alibi According to Kudoki, Obara had an alibi, both in time as well as in physical capabilities. Let's look at the facts. According to Kozue's autopsy report, she was estimated to have died between the 30th of June and the 1st of July. Obara arrived at his brother's house on the 29th of June at 9.30am and had stayed near the vicinity of Tanohata village until he went missing making it unlikely he drove nearly two hours to the place where Kozue B's body was found from this time onwards. However, police extended the time of death to the 28th of June, allegedly after his alibi came to light. The Iwate Nippo reported the following. As a result of the judicial autopsy conducted on the 2nd of July, the estimated time of death for Misato was about one to two days prior to the autopsy which seems to be between the morning of the 30th of June and the morning of the 1st of July. However, the body lay face down in a stream of about 20 to 30 centimeters deep and was exposed to cold water. Under these conditions, the temporal changes in the body are delayed and the possibility the time of death could be extended cannot be ruled out. According to forensic literature, estimating an accurate time of death can be tricky, with one report saying, Numerous researchers have examined various methods of estimating time since death in the past. While the results are encouraging and deemed useful, all the authors agree that there are extremely variable factors, often beyond the control of the examiner in real-life scenarios. In literature, among others, differences in temperature of the body and environment, clothing worn by the victim, Circumstances of death including exposure to the elements and retrieval and storage of samples before analysis can cause variations in estimations of time of death as well. Kudoki seemed convinced the initial estimated time of death to be the truth, saying that the medical examiner would have already incorporated the cold stream environment in the estimated time of death and that the change of the estimated time of death was only done after it was known that Obata had a solid alibi for the initial time of death period while police believed the estimated time of death to be influenced by external factors, extending the period to when Kozue B was seen alive last. In SIE Weekly, Kudoki responded by saying that ignoring the time of death set by the medical examiner also ignored the conclusions drawn from rigor mortis and the content of the victim's stomach. The second remark Kudoki highlights in his research is Obada's hand injury. Obara had sustained a hand injury somewhere between the time Kozue A fled from Obara's car on the morning of the 28th and 2.14 am on the 29th when he was captured with his hand injury on the gas station security camera. As mentioned before, Obara had been inconsistent in his answers as to how he injured his hand. While some believe he injured his hands while strangling Kozue B, others believe he met Mr. Z that night and was injured as he had been before. Kuroki visited and interviewed the doctor who examined Obara that evening, who said the following. If Obara had in fact been the killer and the medical examiner was in fact off by one to two days as said by police, it's most likely he strangled Kozue B after she sent her last message to Kozue A around 30 minutes after midnight on the 29th. This could fit with the timing that he was seen on CCTV footage of the gas station at 2.14 am, which is believed to be a gas station in the Morioka city area, a 30 to 40 minute drive from where Kozue B was found. If this is true, he could have sustained the hand injury during or after the murder instead of before. 
To summarize, a lot of Obara's alibi depends on the difficult to estimate time of death. Whether to believe Kuroki's side, sternly keeping to the medical examiner's report, or choosing the police's side, who extended the time of death after learning Obara's alibi, is up for discussion. A side note is that in multiple sources, it's stated that it's believed Kozuebi was strangled by hand, without using an item or rope. While only the concluding page of the autopsy report is publicized, a band-shaped epidermal detachment is described, which doesn't specifically exclude an item to be used. The Iwate Nippo reported that while it was less likely a string was used, either hands or another item were likely possibilities as to how the victim was strangled. It's not reported whether or not the medical examiner checked for signs under Kozue B's fingernails, as she might have fought back, leaving some of the killer's DNA under her fingernails. Kuroki states that even if Obara could have strangled Kozue B with one hand, it would have been nearly impossible to dispose her 52 kg weighing body after injuring his hand. Obara was reportedly 170 cm tall and had a body weight somewhere between 55 and 60 kg, which wasn't far off from Kozue B's body's characteristics. One journalist tries to prove the difficulty of moving the body by trying to reenact the supposed action at the scene where Kozue B was found. ロバレオ Number 2. Motive When looking purely at the motive, Obara didn't really seem to have a reason to kill Kozue B and didn't even know her that well. In fact, he asked for her help shortly before her death. Obara's brother stated that it would be very strange for his brother to arrive as calm as he did at his house if he would have killed Kozue B only hours before. It was only two days later, even before police publicly announced that Kozue B's body was found, that Obara suddenly became extremely upset as if the real killer had called him to say Kozue B had been murdered. In addition, some mentioned it was strange Obara had a lot of contact with police in the days surrounding Kozue B's death as killers usually try to avoid police as much as possible. Based on public information, someone who might indirectly have a motive to harm Kozue B was Mr. Z. Some speculate Mr. Z to be part of a Yakuza-like group, as his online ID suggested at the time. He might have killed Kozue B and left her in an easy-to-discover area, as is sometimes done by Yakuza, to send others a message. While the name Kozue Sato was written on the contract as a guarantor, Mr. Z might have killed the wrong Kozue to send Obara a message, as Kozue A seems to suggest in an interview Kuroki conducted with her. Number 3. Extortion Case The extortion case against Mr. Z was filed by Obara and Kosue A on June 3rd, though he suddenly requested the withdrawal of the extortion case on the 28th. Interestingly enough, when Obada and his father requested police to dismiss the report, they convinced both to keep the case, saying they would arrest someone in the next few days. In addition, soon after filing the complaint initially, Obada's brother, who was an eyewitness to the extortion incident, was questioned by police. Then, when Kozue B's body was found three days after he tried to withdraw the report, police all of a sudden seemed to have stopped investigating the extortion case. After Obara's father called Officer Chiba from the Kuji police station, the officer insisted that police had received the complaint, but that it had not been accepted. Hi, hi. 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 H
はいはい、今ちょっと忙しいのでね、何その被害届け自体は受理してないもの。The true meaning of this statement is unknown. According to a blog post from Kudoki on the 21st of July 2009, Obata had mentioned to his father that the threats by Mr. Z had decreased, but Kudoki didn't think there was the reason for the withdrawal. Rather, he thought Obata was forced to dismiss the case, which he backed up by Kozue A's statement, who said that she was afraid she would get caught and might be killed since she couldn't pay the 1.2 million yen as a guarantor. Kudoki theorized that Mr. Z could have something to do with the whole ordeal. Some mentioned that Mr. Z could have taken Kozue B hostage, have him mistaken her for Kozue A, then hurt and even killed her to send Obada a message when Obada failed to dismiss the complaint. After all, even police seem to have called the wrong Sato home after they found the body, as if they were not aware that there were two Kozue Satos. It's reported that before Kudoki's first press conference, many were unaware that Kozue A and B were two different people. Besides Mr. Z mentioning he didn't threaten Obata with weapons and only asked for 100,000 yen instead of 1.2 million yen, Kudoki mentioned the following on his blog I visited Mr. Z's home and interviewed him directly. This is the fourth time. As usual, Mr. Z says that he has not been investigated by police. Why don't police ask Mr. Z about the situation? Kudoki then asked Mr. Z the following When was the last time you met suspect Obata? It was on New Year's Day last year. This meant Mr. Z had met Obata about six months after the extortion incident. Kozue A questioned this to be the case, as Obata had been trying to hide from Mr. Z since the incident happened. Kudoki then went on to ask, Didn't you ask the damage report to be withdrawn? I didn't even know Obata filed a complaint, so I never tried to get him to withdraw it. So do you have an alibi from the 29th of June to the 2nd of July? June 29th was a Sunday, and I was not feeling well, so I stayed in bed at home. From the 30th of June, I took a few days off from work and stayed at home. During that time, I visited a nearby hospital. Interestingly enough, Kudoki then visited the hospital and asked for information when Mr. Z had visited the hospital, which turned out to be May 19th, over a month before the murder took place. When confronted, Mr. Z only stated it to be a misunderstanding, but that he took a break from work and stayed at home. While there is no solid evidence linking Mr. Z to Kozue B's murder, his alibi is rather weak, and his answers seem to have inconsistencies. In the end, it seems no warrant has ever been filed to search Mr. Z's house, even though he might have been connected to Kozue B's case as well. To Kuroki's frustration, no attempts seem to have been made to investigate the extortion incident after Obata went missing. Number 4. Car Police believed Obata was the killer and that Kozue B was strangled in his car. However, Kudoki mentioned three discrepancies when it comes to the car. Number 1. Even though red female footwear was found in his car, together with hair from Kozue B, this does not prove that Kozue B was murdered in the vehicle. Kozue B's body was found without shoes, though the footwear in her car wasn't what Kozue B had been wearing that day, according to her parents. The sandals Kozue B had been wearing had depicted Hello Kitty, while the footwear found in Obata's car didn't. Number 2. After the accident, business cards of Iwate Prefectural Police detectives were removed from the business card holder that was placed in the sunshade above the driver's seat. In addition, Instead of Obata's usual key, his spare key was left in the car door. Number 3. According to Kudoki's interviews, Mr. Tadokoro, who had picked Obata up after the incident, but then went back to look for his wallet in the crashed car, was never questioned by police. あなたも犯人のね、小原克之の共犯者だという思われる可能性っていうのは多分あると思うんですよ。ありますね。ね。本来だったら自分の指紋も黒木さんが言ったように出たべたついてるんだけど、俺のとこに一回も来ないし、自
車の中も操作するのかなって調べるのかなと思ったらそのままもう上がっちゃってったからだからなんで調べねえんだろうって思ったんです What was the latch they took prints from the car later on? They had supposedly not done this initially, and it's not certain if they did at all. Since the car was a crime scene according to police, it's interesting that it's rumored that it wasn't investigated more detailed from the beginning. Number 5. Unosu Cliff Kuroki mentioned multiple strange occurrences in the investigation of Unosu Cliff the last place Obara was seen alive. Let's take a look at the three most talked about theories as to what happened. Theory number one. Police believed Obara to have faked his death and ran from the scene. For him to have taken off from the scene, he would have at least walked for 500 meters to the nearest parking location through an area with multiple visitors. It's reported that together with the other items that were left behind on the spot Obara was last seen, a pair of sandals were found. For Obara to have walked barefoot to escape would be unusual. A main road where he could have caught a ride would have been further away, with no reports of hitchhikers or stolen vehicles being publicized. Furthermore, it's reported that Obara's sandals were white, while the ones found at the cliff's edge were reportedly blue, with red stripes. Theory number two. Kuroki theorized that Obara was abducted and possibly killed based on a few observations. First of all, Mr. Z is rumored to have been part of the Japanese underworld and has harmed and threatened Obara before. On top of this, Mr. Z's username on the post he used to find Obara was allegedly the Yakuza, which he later admitted in an interview, saying, I admit that I posted on a nationwide wanted mobile phone website using the ID, the Yakuza, but I only wrote what I thought at the time. I deleted the writing myself. It's also true that Kozue's name and mobile phone number were written on the notepaper as a joint guarantor. If police would be called, I would say the same thing. Another comment stated that the way Kozue B's body was thrown off the bridge without properly hiding the victim could be a Yakuza way of disposing a body as the discovery of the body would give a warning sign to Obara that he would be next. This in contrast to Kuroki's observation that the surrounding area consisted of bushes where the body could have been hidden easily. A last remark is that according to the person who dropped Obara off near Unosu Cliff, Obara had no items or luggage with him other than his phone. Even his pockets didn't seem to contain items and he had not stopped along the way to get anything either. The only items that could be explained were two coffee cans, which were brought over by Obara's acquaintance right before his disappearance. Who did the items belong to if Obara had not taken them with him himself? Theory number three, Obara jumped to his death. A third main theory is that Obara in fact jumped from the 190 meter cliff and lost his life. Unfortunately, while Obata was last seen on the 2nd of July and the items were found on the 3rd of July, police only started their investigation of the scene on the morning of the 4th. Besides police's slow response, there were no signs police actually went to Inosu Cliff after they were called about the situation. In addition, while Obata's father had requested police to use dogs to find his son, his request was denied by officers who stated it was expensive and if he wanted them to use dogs, he would have to pay for it himself. According to Kuroki though, the public shouldn't have to pay for police dogs to be deployed for cases. Kuroki believed it was strange police didn't put in more effort to find who they believed to be the killer of Kozue B, theorizing that police is possibly hiding something. Another interesting discrepancy is that the Iwate Nippo reported a local fishery official mentioned if he jumped off the cliff and made a hole because the area is overgrown with trees, there must be a trace remaining somewhere. Isn't it unlikely that he would directly fall into the sea? Kuroki, however, wrote on his blog as a reply. However, after actually inspecting the scene, I realized that this was a complete lie. As a counter-argument, he mentioned that there were barely any trees at the location Obara stood, as seen on one of Kuroki's photos. In addition, he added a photo in which he had drawn the trajectory of which Obara could have fallen, 
Kuroki wrote that even though he didn't believe Obara jumped as the most likely possibility, he did feel the statement was only made in support of police's theory that Obara had faked his own death. Number 6. Media and Police Kuroki had his suspicions media and police were somehow working together to cover up details that would discredit certain conclusions police had made. Kuroki believed that the minimal investigative efforts that conveniently pointed towards Obara were insufficient to state he was the culprit. On his blog, he writes that on one hand, police took more than a day to even investigate the whereabouts of Katsuyuki Obara after his disappearance. In contrast, Obara was placed on the national wanted list with a bounty of 1 million yen after only 4 months of investigating. For some context, after reported more than 1100 people on the wanted list at the time, including Obara, for only 8 of them a bounty was set paid by tax money. In addition, the other 7 had reportedly been on the wanted list for a long time before the reward system was used, making the measure seem extreme in Obara's case. Another strange action was the creation of the wanted poster, which can be found all over Japan. The initial wanted poster mentioned, This is the criminal who murdered a 17-year-old girl at the time. About a year later though, in July of 2009, the poster's headline was corrected to, This is the case of a murder of a 17-year-old girl at the time, no longer specifically pointing towards Obata as the definite culprit. Kuroki sent questions to the National Police Agency, including questions like, why was Obara written as the culprit on the poster? At which police only replied that the poster was created to inform the public of the incident and its current bounty. Rather than answering the question, police seemed to dodge giving a clear answer. Eventually, the Prefectural Police Criminal Planning Division explained, there is no particular meaning, the meaning has not changed, we still believe that Obara is the culprit. Kudoki, however, believed that if there is no meaning to the change, why would police adjust the poster? Another tactic Kudoki described that police might have used was the information about Kozue B's tattoo that was leaked. Kudoki believed information about Kozue B's tattoos was leaked as a way to lower public sympathy for the victim's family due to tattoos being less accepted in Japanese society overall. As Kudoki mentioned, as soon as tattoos were reported in the local newspaper, the way people in the neighborhood perceived Kozue B's death changed dramatically. The decrease in sympathy for the family caused the separation of the media and the victim's family, with the family being averse to interviews as a result. The harm brought on by the leak led some to believe that police initially leaked the information to the public. In the end, it's not certain whether it was police who leaked the information, as some sources reported Kozue B to have posted photos of her tattoos on her own public profile online. Kuroki decided to distribute a weekly Asai article to 1500 households within Tanohata village in which he had been interviewed about the incident. While many accepted the article and encouraged Kuroki to continue, notably the family of the village councillor refused and said they had no involvement with the incident and that they would not accept the article. They also told Kuroki to please go home. Kuroki was then pushed and let out the door. From Kuroki's blog, it can be read that he had been disappointed multiple times that media had not reported more about the incident. For example, Kuroki had appeared on a TV program in May of 2010, which went into more detail about the case. Though after the TV special had aired, the media stayed quiet and asked no follow-up interviews according to Kuroki's blog. Police had not taken any actions either after Kuroki's insight had been aired on TV. From this moment forward, Kuroki wrote, he learned about the limits of journalism. About a month after Kudoki's first press conference, a second press conference was organized at the Bar Association Hall in Tokyo's Chiyoda district. This time, the father of suspected Katsuyuki Obata had filed a complaint for human rights relief with the Japan Federation of Bar Associations, calling for the suspension of his son's presence on the national wanted list for Kozue B's murder. With the complaint, he submitted a 13-page document explaining his case. During the press conference, he explained, 
上皇天皇、警察と、ここは委員会にしたようです、その後に守岡であの記者会見があったようなんですが、まあ、それでもまあ私が見ている限りは、警察の方は動いてくれてない、全然。私はですね、克行が本当に犯人なら犯人でいいんですよ、場合によっては死刑でもいいと思ってます。もう一人殺してんですからね、犯人ならば、下手すれば、どっかで殺されてるんじゃないかな、犯人にさせられて、そしてどっかに埋められて、だからあのもう一回捜査してほしいんですよ、やめてくれとまで電話しました、先生に、もう、黒木さんに、ね、もういいです、もう犯人でいいです。でもさっっき言ったようにね、孫とかね、どう考えるとね。In the following months, Obara's father and Kuroki made multiple pleas to the investigators to request for more information about the investigation. On the 2nd of July in 2009, Kazushi Obara and Akio Kuroki visited the Kuji police station to specifically ask whether or not the Fudai Village extortion incidents report had been reported by police. The deputy chief replied, A damage report has been filed. However, I cannot answer whether it was accepted or not, as it's related to the incident of Kozue B's murder. This was the first time police acknowledged that they had received Obara's complaint about the extortion incident. This reply also suggested that the investigators were in fact aware of a possible connection between the extortion case and the murder case. In August of 2009, an information session was held in Tanohata village at which flyers were handed out about the incident. At the time, signatures were gathered to appeal the incident and to request a re-examination of the investigation. First, I want to understand that Tanohata is not the only one in Tanohata. Over the following months, about 2,170 signatures were gathered, constituting to 54% of Tanohata's population at the time. In April of 2010, Kuroki visited the Iwate Prefectural Office to submit the signatures to request a third party investigation committee, though the request was dismissed by Iwate Governor Takuya Tatsumasu, who mentioned it was outside of his jurisdiction, as can be seen in the following official document. まあ、いわゆる第三者委員会といいますかね、そういったもの設置についてはですね、その設置というのは今のところは考えていません。After their request was ignored, Kuroki's wife reported her husband to become less energetic day by day, especially after barely seeing any media reporting or police action surrounding this situation, as he had extensively wrote about on his blog. Kuroki mentioned that while some media outlets, as the Asahi Shimbun, had reported about the incident, Surprisingly, many local news outlets had not reported about the investigation Kuroki and his family had worked on at all. On June 3rd that same year, Kyoto News reported that Obara's father filed a lawsuit against both the Iwate prefectural government as well as the national government. Kazushi Obara claimed his son was identified as the culprit in Kozue B's murder while lacking proper evidence. He demanded the cancellation of the public investigation of his son. Also asking for 7.6 million yen and damages for defamation of his family. Lawyer Tsutomi Shimizu, who has undertaken multiple cases fighting against police corruption and false accusations, mentioned, I'd like to know the basis for determining that his son is the culprit. However, Judge Nobuyuki Kaihara of the Morioka District Court stated, Being wanted is a means of receiving information, and it's difficult to assess defamation. While the Morioka District Court decided to dismiss the case against both government bodies in April of 2014, not all claims were set aside. The wanted posters initially claimed, This is the criminal who murdered a 17 year old girl at the time. With this statement, the court judged that the police did violate the innocent until proven guilty principle by labeling Katsuyuki Obara as the culprit on the wanted posters. With this conclusion, Obara's father did not appeal the decision. And the court's decision was finalized. On Monday, November 1st, 2010, the public reward for information leading to Katsuyuki Obara's arrest is increased from 1 million yen to up to 3 million yen. Kuroki posted the following on Twitter at the time Today, the reward for wanted suspect Katsuyuki Obara has been increased to 3 million yen. 
This is the truth that the National Police Agency, requested by the Ivate Prefectural Police, wanted to hide. Tax money is used by police to cover up crimes. Everyone, please raise your voices in pursuit. Thank you very much. Kudoki was reported to be frustrated and disappointed, allegedly saying, They're spending 3 million yen of people's tax money without doing a proper investigation. That day, Kudoki told his family he went to meet someone for work and that he would stay the night in Tokyo, after which he left his home. It's reported that Kudoki had called his wife's brother on his cell phone this day, but it's not made public what was said. The next morning, on November 2nd at 9 a.m., Akio Kudoki's son, Akinari Kudoki, and a former colleague received a worrying, supposed scheduled email from Kudoki. His friend described the mail to include the statement, I'm watching over you from high above. The friend immediately called Akinari, who started looking for his father. A little after 11 a.m. that day, Akinari found his father's body in his car at the grounds of a temple in Ichihara City's Imatomi area in Chiba Prefecture. Emergency services were called, but by the time they had arrived, Kudoki had already passed away. Kudoki's slumped body was found in the passenger seat of his car. Within the back seat, burned out charcoal briquettes. In addition, the car contained a receipt printed at 4 p.m. the previous day, showing Kudoki went to a hardware store to purchase two charcoal stoves, work gloves, and matches. Based on this information, Ichihara police eventually concluded Kudoki had died by his own hand. Due to the seemingly unexpected death of the 52-year-old journalist, rumors started to arise of Kudoki being murdered by someone who was involved with Kozue B's death, though Kudoki's family members, friends, and his lawyer all deny this to be the case and feel certain that Akio Kudoki had died by his own hand. This could also be backed up by a note Kudoki had left behind. It's reported that the case of Kozue B's murder, the lack of action by police and media to pursue the case, and the difficult financial situation he was in due to the case contributed to Kudoki's physical and mental decline. It's believed that on the 1st of November, Kudoki visited and drank alcohol at his father's grave, who had also been a police officer. While no judicial autopsy was performed, it's believed he then took sleeping pills he got prescribed in October and lighted the charcoal briquettes while in his car. On Kudoki's blog, his son addressed the rumors about his father's death, saying that he is certain his father took his own life. Akinari debunks the rumors of his father possibly being murdered, saying that the note and emails he left behind are believed to be authentic, also saying that he believes financial trouble and depression were not the reason for his father's death. Rather, he explains, he called the Iwate girl murder incident the last incident that he would risk his life for as a journalist. He continued to pursue the case until he had no further options. As a last resort, in exchange for his own death, he tried to gain lots of voices of pursuit. My father was a person who always thought ahead when he acted, so he must have thought about what would happen if he died. He hoped that the news of his death would spark interest in a case that he had dedicated his journalistic career to, in the hopes that people would raise their voice to investigate the case. In the message, Kudoki's son added that while his father was critical of certain police investigations and practices, Kudoki loved the police and recognized that because citizens rely on officers, he wanted to improve the station's quality. Kudoki sent his will to his lawyer, Tsutomu Shimizu, around the time of his death as well. In addition, a note was found which allegedly included Kudoki to have written the following. I don't need to say it now, but the Iwate incident changed my life. I have no regrets about it. There are many people I want to meet wherever I go. I also want to meet Kozue Sato. I want to know the truth of the incident. In the note, Kudoki asked to receive a funeral ceremony with his family, probably being concerned about the public curiosity while his wife and children would have to mourn his death. On the back of the note, Kudoki placed a large sticky note with his wife's cell phone number and the words, thank you in advance. His lawyer and longtime friend responded with an extensive post on Kudoki's blog, which discussed multiple aspects surrounding Kudoki's death. His lawyer confirmed the belief that Kudoki had taken his own life as well, though did state there to be some financial trouble. As a contributing factor to Kudoki's death, the lawyer mentioned the effects caused by the negligence and according to Kudoki wrongful accusation of Katsuyuki Obata. The lawyer also described the following dialogue. The lawyer said, This is clearly beyond the scope of a journalist's job. Kudoki answered, I know. The lawyer replied, 
No matter how much you try and get into it all by yourself, the police won't take action. Anyone who was part of the police would understand. Kuroki said, No, it's a problem unless the police takes action in this case. Then the lawyer replied, The other party is not just a person. They're an organization of government officials who get paid a monthly salary even if they don't do anything. So no matter how hard you try, there's no way they're going out of their way and go through the trouble of a reinvestigation. Then Kuroki said, No matter what happens, we'll take action. His lawyer replied, If you don't calmly deal with this problem as if it's someone else's life, your family's life will be ruined. Then Kuroki said, This incident is my life. Kuroki's death left the investigation into Kozue B's murder stranded, and the Sato and Obara family were left with the conclusions made by police. Kuroki's body was cremated on the 4th of November, and his remains were laid to rest at his grave. Even though Kuroki's blog had been deleted twice, one time suspiciously against Kuroki's will when he was still alive, and for a second and final time in 2019 after Yahoo suspended their services, Parts of Kuroki's blog posts are still accessible through the Wayback Machine Archive website. Together with Kuroki's own blog post, a documentary by Abema TV was made 10 years after Kuroki's death about the incident, in which his work surrounding the Iwate murder case is discussed. Kuroki's wife, Masako, and son, Akinari, appear in the documentary as well to give their side of the story. <laughs> In the documentary, Akinari Kuroki, together with journalist Tomoko Nagano, visit people and locations his father came across in his efforts to uncover the truth. Further in, Kuroki's wife Masako describes her husband's declining mental health after media and police ignore his findings. While the tragic death of the journalist who fought for more than two years to give Kozue's case the investigation and media attention it deserves, his family and friends try their best to let Kuroki's efforts not go to waste. Friend and weekly Asahi editor-in-chief Kazuomi Yamaguchi remembers Kuroki kept investigating even without income, taking on debt while trying to pursue the truth. In an interview on the Asahi TV website, he summarized Kuroki as follows. When you think about journalism as a profession, everyone lives their life thinking, how much can I get for reporting on this? Everyone is calculating somehow. Kuroki didn't do this. This is Kuroki's sense of justice, his goodness, and his pure nature. To put it in harsh terms, I would say this is journalism. It's frustrating though. Katsuyuki Obara is still present as a suspect on the national wanted list and his whereabouts are unknown up until now. At least 10,000 wanted posters have been spread across police departments, train stations, and bus terminals depicting Obara and his characteristics. On the 15th anniversary of his disappearance, it was reported over 600 pieces of information from all over Japan were shared with police about people resembling the suspect. While well, report says, I saw someone similar to him on the subway, and he used to work for me, have been submitted. No strong leads have been reported to police. It was also mentioned that as of now, about 50 people still work on the case. Kuroki made a plea on his blog to Katsuyuki Obara, saying that he looked into Obara's past and gathered photos of Obara's upbringing. Kuroki then asked Obara to turn himself in, saying, By the way, Katsuyuki Obara, if you're still alive, I strongly urge you to turn yourself in. If you don't like the police, you can contact me. If you turn yourself in, I'll do what I can. I promise to defend you to the best of my ability, because I'm sure you didn't kill Kozue Sato. While information about Kozue B is limited, and her family only appears to have made brief statements in the past, Kuroki posted photos of a visit of Obara's father and Kozue A to the shrine of the Sato household. Kuroki had also wrote on his blog about a visit to Kozue B's family, 
in which Kozuebi's father believed Katsuyuki Obara to be the cause of his daughter's death. Having said, Katsuyuki Obara is the culprit who killed my daughter. No matter what, Kozue would not have been killed if Katsuyuki hadn't taken my daughter out. While her father Masahiro Sato seemed to disagree with Kuroki's theory at the time, Kozuebi's grandmother Kikuko was more open to help his investigation. On the 23rd of May 2009, Kikuko briefly spoke in front of a camera about her feelings towards the incident. <laughs> After Kudoki's death in 2010, the case seemed to have frozen in time, with his blog post as evidence of his fight for the truth. One of his posts saying, This may be a blog of sadness, but at the same time, it's also a battle blog. Even if TV and the mass media are breaking down, I will always discover and announce the truth. That's what a journalist is. To that end, I would like to ask everyone for your continuing support. Please, spread the word everywhere. With no sign of Katsuyuki Obara since the day he disappeared from Unosu Cliff in 2008 and no further publicized leads from police, we're left wondering what actually happened. Did Kozue B get killed by Katsuyuki Obara? Is Obara still alive, or did he fall to his death on the day he disappeared? Did police cover up information, and is there someone else involved in this mysterious murder case? In the end, all Kudoki's efforts seem to raise more questions than answers. And while we might never learn who the culprit is, what happened to Obara, and why Kozue B had to die in the first place, one certainty is that events that transpired in this case left an immeasurable scar to the Sato family, Kuroki's family, and the Obara family. Mikozue Sato and Akio Kuroki rest in peace.